This is the Paycheck to Daycheck Reselling Podcast. I'm Liz. And I'm Ashley. Together, we have been making money online collectively for over 10 years. Our mission is to help you start, learn, and grow a reselling business and to inspire you to turn your paycheck into a daycheck. The world is changing and we want to help you change with it. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Paycheck to Daycheck podcast. Today, we have an awesome guest. It is Matt Hines, aka uh, Buy Low, Sell Hines on Instagram. If you guys are not following him, you definitely should. He is very, very intelligent about all things Amazon, sourcing, wholesale, all of the things that this community seems to have a lot of questions about. And he's super, super helpful as well. I think there's a ton of fear around uh, starting on Amazon. A lot of people are scared to you know, make mistakes or mess up. And I think that to kind of get over the fear or suppress the fear, we have to do that with information and knowledge. So that's our goal today, just to ask Matt a million questions and get all the knowledge out of that brain that we possibly can. (laughs) So thanks, Matt, for coming uh, on the show. Um, Just give us a little intro. How did you you get started? What do you do exactly? Uh, Give us the rundown. Sure. Uh, so my name is Matt by Lil Sal Hines. Um, so I've been doing, I'm full-time on Amazon for a little over, uh, probably like four and a half years now. Um, so I do primarily Amazon. I'm actually a little bit on Walmart now. And then uh, I, I always have a little bit like eBay. Um, that's more for like Amazon returns and that kind of stuff. But long story short of how I really got started is, so my mom used to take me to like yard sales and auctions when I was growing up. Uh, and I've always kind of had like the entrepreneurial mindset. Like I would buy stuff at those and resell it online or or like in, or I would do like find stuff super undercut on certain yard sales, have my own yard sale back and forth. Uh, and then what really put me over the edge to kind of start this was I worked, I was a store manager of a grocery store before I had a shift manager who was like an extreme couponer, like could have been on the show, extreme couponing. Um, and all the time she would be like, Hey Matt, do you want 20 of these? Do you want 40 of these? I don't want them. I just, I got, they paid me to take them out of the store. Um, and I was just kind of like, there's gotta be a way for you to make money. And she's like, well, I market them locally. And I'm like, no, like big picture, there's gotta be a way. Um, and we both just kind of like looked online, found some Amazon videos, um, you know, watched videos on YouTube for three months and finally was like, you know what, let me try this. Um, I did it for about two, three months, uh, doing about 20 hours a week after, you know, working 60, 70 hours a week. So I saw what I could make doing an exhausted 20 hours a week. Uh, I had six months of bills saved up and was like, you know what, let's dive in, let's go for it. And, uh, the journey started. That's awesome. So you started about three years ago, you said, while Uh, you were still working at Aldi? About four, four and a half years ago. Okay. All right. Awesome. So how long did it take you to go full time and quit your job there? Um, so honestly, yeah, probably about three months. I probably should have waited a little bit longer. It was just one of those. I've always been, uh, very confident in what I'm doing. Um, and I spent, and when I say I I was spending 20, 30 hours a week, 20, 30 hours a week, like actually doing this, I was still probably spending another 10, 15, um, which obviously adds up to a lot of hours in between, but it was just like, just watching videos, uh, taking in content, whether it was on Instagram, YouTube, whatever it was, just taking in content, trying to figure out, um, trying to hopefully avoid mistakes. Um, although I will say when you brought this up earlier, uh, mistakes are unavoidable. They are going to happen. Honestly, I, I enjoy making mistakes because it's, you learn what not to do because I'd rather learn what not to do on a smaller scale um, than make those mistakes on a bigger scale. Cause obviously the bigger you get, the mistakes are way more costly. Um, I mean, it all, obviously it's all proportionate, but still it's, it's way, it's, it's way bigger, but I was probably three months. I probably should have done six months uh, based on what it was. I mean, things are a little bit different now. I feel like generally there's a lot more content, a lot more information out now. So I feel like I would have been confident three months in now versus when I, when I first started. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yeah. That's super smart. So on Amazon, it's not like how many items you have listed. It's how many SKUs do you have, right? Usually. Yeah. It's usually how many SKUs. Um, So my number is going to sound a little higher, but it's also so like, I have, uh, so I'll say it in two numbers. So I have, I think 3,800, uh, different SKUs, but I've also got a lot of like used DVDs from like a big bulk purchase. Um, but I probably not include the DVDs. I probably have, uh, I've read around a thousand different items listed on Amazon right now. Awesome. So, and like, give us an idea of what kind of items you are selling on there. 
who, I mean, I've got uh, 18 million different makeup products. Um, don't ask me what any of them are. I have no <laughs> idea. They, they make me money. So cool. And oh, and that's actually since I'm saying that that's a good lesson for people is uh, a lot of the times you so it's, it's nice to get started into products that you know, because you have knowledge as far as like what's popular and the brands are. But once you get into it, you need to be able to uh, shop and buy anything and almost just go based on the numbers. Like you need to be able to recognize brands, but know the numbers. Um, there's plenty of times I've been in Marshall's TJ Maxx and I've spent hours in the beauty section. I've been in the women's section sourcing bras and having like the people come over and be like, do you need help? I'm like, no, I'm good. Thanks. Um, <laughs> like you have to be able to get out of the comfort zone and you have to be able to get to the point where, you know, like you just need to find stuff that makes you money. But I sell beauty products, toys, sporting goods, clothing, um, some like automotive stuff. That's tough on Amazon. Hats, sandals, shoes. Honestly, Pretty a little. Much I don't yeah, I don't. I honestly don't think there's a category that I'm not in. To be honest. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's really important too. Like to not have like a weirded out feeling about sourcing something that might be a little bit out of your comfort zone. Yeah. If it's gonna make you money, it's gonna make you money, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I honestly probably. I mean, so this time of year, going into fourth quarter, I'll obviously do mostly. I mean, the majority of my sales will be toys, but um, otherwise, I'd think beauty products is probably like as a category is probably my biggest category. And I don't okay. know anything other than like this brand's popular. This brand's popular. So. And do you feel comfortable giving us an idea of like your numbers maybe for last year? Um, yeah. Uh, so I did, I think it ended up being 1.2 million on Amazon last year. Um, and then we have, I think we're at, uh, I was just looking at my numbers before. So we're at like 750,000 so far this year, but our, our goals are to do probably around 250 in November by itself and three to 350 in December. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. It's, it's getting yeah. there. Yep. Absolutely. That's, so. you know, that's incredible. Good for you. Thanks. And we're up to about 10,000 a month on Walmart and sales as well, too. All right. So is your main focus, I'm assuming it's uh, online arbitrage at this point because you have so many SKUs and so much going on. But I know, you know, if you follow him out on Instagram, you might see him every once in a while going on a couple of sourcing trips and he'll post, you know, like, what store he went to, whether it's like a Marshall's or a TJ Maxx or something like that. And like how much he spent and what he thinks he can, you know, profit off of that. Um, so are you focused mostly on online arbitrage, wholesale? What are you doing these days? Yeah, mostly online arbitrage. I mean, I love RA. Like I will always, I, I'll be, I could be doing two, three million a month and I'll still find like one random day where I'm going to hit up a Marshall's. It's just like the hunt will never get old. Like finding that product for $3 that sells for 25, like the, the rush of finding that, like that won't ever get old. Even if I only find one of them. Um, but yeah, so I, I'd primarily say we're probably, probably 80% OA, um, 10% wholesale, 10% RA. Um, and then RA, honestly. So like I did I went back in the stores a little bit just when I was getting Walmart started, just because I knew there'd be different opportunities as far as that. Cause like a lot of the stuff that um, is red restricted that you can't sell on Amazon, you actually can sell on Walmart. And I had to remember a whole bunch of products that I knew would be good opportunities. If I could sell them, I just couldn't uh, not doing it on a different platform. But yeah. So I'm probably 80% OA, uh, 10 RA and 10 wholesale at this point. All right. And do you do mostly like FBA fulfilled by Amazon, fulfilled by merchants? Like how, how are you structuring your business? Yeah. I mean, it's probably 95% um, FBA uh, currently. Um, that'll switch a little bit as we get more into fourth quarter. It'll probably be closer to 15% FBM um, once we get into fourth quarter, just because, you know, like as much as you can, as much as this is going to be my fifth, fourth quarter, like you can only predict how fast certain things are going to sell. So you got to be able to kind of switch gears and, and be able to do FBM for certain items because the, there's items that, like I said, you know, it might sell 30 times a month during the right, you know, the, during the year, you think it's going to sell 90 times a month in fourth quarter and it sells 90 times in a week. And then all of a sudden you can get more, but you know, it won't be available FBA um, before Christmas. You have to fill those orders yourself. So yeah, it probably switch to 15, 20% FBM as we get into like November. But I, I mean, I try and make it 90, 95% FBA uh, year round. I try to, it's just, it's way more convenient, especially the business model that I have currently. And so going back really quick to what we were talking about at the very beginning about being intimidated or having fear around starting on Amazon, were you intimidated when you first started and how did you get over that? Uh, one, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, the biggest thing I think 
that I didn't realize that I know now is that there are so many people out there that are willing to help. Um, and that's why I try and make myself like I put myself out there and available to help because like the more I reached out, the more I realized that I think sometimes because I think it's obviously selling on Amazon is becoming more and more popular, but at the same time, I think it's such a, a small community that when people reach out and have questions, people are excited to give answers because they don't like always have the people to talk to in their day-to-day lives about Amazon. Uh, so they're like, Oh yeah, absolutely. I'll help you. And I can tell you all about Amazon because they can't like, you can't just explain it to somebody that isn't into this. It, it was extremely intimidating. And again, watch videos. Um, my best advice when you're watching videos though, is don't limit yourself to like watching one person, watch multiple people because that's going to create questions for you. Um, I remember watching videos of like four different people and two people said one thing, two people said another thing. And I was like, okay, well, obviously there's some kind of disconnect here. So like, those are the things that I was like, all right, I need to dive more into this. Those are the things that I reached out to people on Instagram, um, looked in forums and that kind of stuff. I was like, okay, some people are saying this, some people are saying this, what do I need to do? So, um, and again, ultimately you're going to make mistakes, learn from the mistakes. It's better to do them in the beginning and ask other people, you know, what mistakes did they make? What did you do? And what, what did you do wrong and how did you do it differently? Yeah, definitely. And I think with going on, like what you said about watching the YouTube videos, um, the information about Amazon, like things change on that platform so quickly. Uh, they change what's required at different times of the year. So information that could have been put out on YouTube last year might not be exact or relevant for this year. So just double checking and making sure that you're not watching a video that's um, you know, a couple of years old, or if you have someone um, available to you that can answer questions just to verify that information, that's a really great idea. Yeah, definitely put a search filter. I so I usually when I'm watching videos, whether it's for Amazon or whatever, from like doing inf- like informative things, I'll put like a six month filter on it. I don't want anything that's older than like six months because, you, like you said, everything changes so much. All right, so walk us through a day in the life of Matt. What does that uh, look like? <laughs> uh, work, work, and work, uh, and the occasional sport. Um, <laughs> So honestly, no, it it depends on the day. I mean, so like Monday is usually very different just because we've got a whole bunch of orders from over the weekend. Again, so like with Walmart, we're still kind of like fulfilling all the orders ourselves. So, and I mean, like even like eBay, the random things I have on eBay is busier from over the weekend. Um, If I find hot items, you know, I'll list those FEM to start because I think think we ended up having, I think 152 uh, orders to fill ourselves between all three platforms yesterday morning. So, I mean, we were doing orders until like one, two o'clock. So, um, so it's usually coming in first thing in the morning, checking to see, you know, what these orders are. My employee pretty much does, uh, she does all the orders. I just kind of like, Hey, do you need help with this? Stuff like that. So we'll go over that. And then I just kind of like, my first thing is I'll walk around and see what, you know, um, what I think she's going to get done for the day, figure out where I need to jump in, that kind of stuff. Um, so I'll organize that. Uh, obviously, I'm going to get going with that. I know it sounds super boring, but it's obviously a part of it. You know, sometimes it might just be I'm jumping in and I'm doing two hours of prep or I'm putting stuff into inventory lab in order to, you know, make a shipment, that kind of stuff. Most mornings, uh, I'll usually go in, check emails, whether it's from wholesalers. And then I literally have a list of probably like 20, 30 stores. And I literally will go to each one of their websites um, and see if they're running deals that day. So um, that's just, I don't even have the, I mean, I have a list written down somewhere, but I don't even use the list anymore. I just know, okay, going here, let me, let me go to Kohl's. Let me go to DSW. Let me go to Crocs. Let me go to Walmart and like, you know, and kind of just see what their deals are that day. Um, so one of my bigger things that I do is uh, I do discounted gift cards as well too. So I'll check and go to a couple of different sites for gift cards and be like, okay, is there any random sites that, you know, are, you know, where they're normally 5% gift cards today, they're 12%. Ooh, they're 12%. Okay. I can probably shop that store today just from the gift cards where I wouldn't normally. So I'll do those. There's a lunch somewhere in, in between there. Uh, I've gotten to the point this time of year where I just, I order freshly. So I've got literally just like a microwave throw it in um, just because I'm very go, go, go. Like my lunch break is probably five, 10 minutes, flip around, keep going. Um, yeah. And then I, so after lunch, um, usually reevaluate, see where things are at for the day, um, that kind of stuff, see what's left for tomorrow and just kind of start prepping for the next day. Um, and again, I mean, a lot of my day, especially this time of year is just going through websites, trying to find orders, going through, you know, wholesale uh, lists and that kind of stuff. You know, again, occasionally, probably one day a week, I might go check out something like I use, I use BrickSeek still just to kind of see, I mean, a lot of it I'm actually just doing is by ordering stuff online from BrickSeek. But, you know, if there's the occasional thing, I'll try, I'll try and like, 
purposely do it where if I know I need to go to Walmart for an errand, I'll wait to do the errand until like, I'm going to go check out something on Brickseek. Um, like it literally, like I structure my personal life around work in the sense that like, I'm only going to Walmart for something I need if I'm going to go deal hunting. Um, but yeah. So I don't know. That's it's, it's not a glamorous thing. It's literally just, you know, there's a lot of prep. There's a lot of boxing stuff up. Um, there's a lot of checking things in, especially with OA. I mean, there's plenty of days we're getting 20, 30 boxes a day of OA stuff that's coming in. So just making sure we open it up, we, we check it, we check it. And again, most of this is um, one of my employees, but she'll, she'll check it in to make sure we got everything removing stickers if we need to poly bagging if we need to um yeah the, the boring work stuff but you know you just if, if you think about it the right way you can go that's money that's money you know you might think that it sounds boring but this is what it takes obviously to run a million dollar amazon business so i think it's important for other people to hear like you're not you're not inactive in your business you're actively participating every single day for the majority of the day like it's not for the faint of heart for sure yeah it's definitely not i mean and again and i'm i'm 4 years in and i'm and i'm still very much doing the day to day i mean obviously the ultimate goal is to get to the point where you're just kind of overseeing hey how's this going hey how's this going and having you know warehouse manager and like an ordering manager and like all that kind of stuff. That's obviously the ultimate goal, but it's not, it's not easy. You don't get there fast, you know, and the more, the more work you put in, like doing it now, the faster you can get there. So, I mean, the, the more times I'm out there, the more times I'm ordering, um, the faster I'm going to get to where I want to be. Yeah. You mentioned two things throughout your day that I wanted to touch on really quickly. The first one was that you have kind of a running list in your head of items or websites that you're checking every single day for their sales. Are those, um, do you have like a list of specific items that you're looking for or just sales in general? Are those items your refillable items? Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, so I definitely do. Okay. So I can clarify. So I do, uh, I definitely have a list of refillables um, where I actually have. So one, I don't suggest leaving it all up here. I'm very <laughs> notorious for leaving it all up here. And then when anybody else needs it, they're like, oh yeah, this. And be like, Matt, can you put that somewhere? So we have access to it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm bad about that. So my suggestion is for everybody else, make an Excel, make it a Google, make it a Google Sheets document and then run through. But so we actually have a replenishable list and we've actually linked all the websites for that particular item on there. So I know if I, Hey, I need to order more of this. I don't need to like go search where it is. I literally just, I go to my refillable list and I click on the link and it brings you right to the website that we normally order it from. Um, if we order from multiple sites, we've got multiple links for the particular product. So refillables are actually super easy for me because I can literally just go down the list and click stuff if I, if I need more. But otherwise with a lot of the sites, it's more, I'm just looking. So if it's like a, uh, I know Crocs, um, last week was like a buy more, save more event. So that if you buy, if you bought two, you could get like 20% off by three, you get 30% by four, you get 40%. And I would just use that as my like basis in order to then do more research into it. Like I didn't have like particular items I was going in. Now there are certain items that I buy from like Crocs that I will look and see, okay, Hey, do I need to refill these, especially while I was having a sale, but then I'll also use those sales as a time to, you know, do that as far as like, Coals. I'm only buying stuff on Coals with like, coal, you know, when they're doing the earning and being able to use Coals cash and that. Kind of. I like to buy items. I try and actually stick away from a lot of the clearance items. I actually like to buy regular price items when it's on sale because usually when the more an item is clearance, the more people are buying it. So I like to find those deals. So even if it's only like a one time, hey, I'm only going to get it this week, I'd rather buy those then because there's less likely that the amount of sellers is going to skyrocket. Yeah. Are you um, using? tactical arbitrage or are you just going to actual websites and then you like have an idea because you've been doing this for so long of what items you should look up and do research on so uh i don't use tactical arbitrage a lot i actually uh this is gonna sound painful i actually enjoy manually scraping uh <laughs> But I do, so if we use it, it's a lot of the times for like the super big sites, like the Walmarts, the Targets, and more using it for like, I'll obviously take it and I'll just like, I'll, I'll scrape Walmart's beauty section, I'll scrape Walmart's sports section and run individual searches on those. But I've definitely found a lot of like tactical arbitrage or like similar stuff actually misses a lot of products. Um, obviously, it doesn't suggest like bundles, which I love bundles. It doesn't take into account as far as like the Amazon small and light program, which I know people are not taking nearly as much advantage of. And so like, it doesn't take that into account. 
as far as that, because it just goes based off the regular fees where small and light is very different. So I use it for like the big, big, big sites, but any smaller sites, that kind of stuff. Uh, I like to manually scrape. I've got another employee. He's 100% remote. He does you know, probably 70% of my ordering. I, I'd rather have him manually scrape because again, I, I, I think manually searching through, yes, it definitely takes longer, but um, I think you can find so many more winners that way. And then again, same thing with like clearance. If I'm doing tactical arbitrage in like Walmart sports section, I guarantee there's probably 20 other people also doing tactical arbitrage in that sports section where not everybody's manually going through and those items that didn't pop up, I might find maybe one or two other people will find. So I do use it. Yes. And it's, and I think it's definitely beneficial, but if you're newer, I don't recommend it one, because I think you should learn what's good, what's bad. And then also I think it's what a hundred dollars a month at a, at a minimum. So it's definitely, it's expensive software. Yeah. The other thing that I wanted to touch on really quick was about the gift cards. And when Liz and I met Matt in the leads group that we were in uh, previously, and what I remember talking to you about this one time about you used the gift cards combined with like Rakuten or Top Cash Back, the you know cash back sites and different like sales that they have going. So you have like all these different ways of lowering your cost of goods. Is there anything else that I'm missing out of that? So gift cards that you bought at a discount, the cash back sites, any sales that they have going on. Is there anything else that I didn't catch? No, I think I think it's pretty much that, but I think it's just it's learning how to combine all of them. Like mm-hmm. I'll use an example of like there's a particular item at PetSmart. Um, so I can occasionally get PetSmart gift cards for 20% off. Um, so this item is normally, I think, like 1969 at a normal price. So every probably for a month span and then a month off month span, this particular item is buy one, get one 50% off. So I'm instantly getting 25% off from that. Um, a lot of the times, uh, Rakuten, Ebates, whatever you want to call it, it's, it'll always be Ebates to me. Uh, we'll run 8% off for that. And then I'll have gift cards that are 20% off of that. So like I'm getting this item that's normally in 1939 or whatever I said, I actually usually end up getting it for around like, I think it's like 868. And, and that's sometimes the profit where like it's it's selling at 21. If you're buying it for 19 and selling it on Amazon for 21, you'd be losing six, seven dollars by the time fees and all that are kind of you know are done. But now I can make this item from 19 down to 850 uh, and I can profit six, seven bucks a piece on this just because of that. But again, on that particular item, I combine a buy one, get one fifty percent off sale on the site, eight percent racket in, and twenty percent off like and twenty percent gift cards. So yeah, if you if you can find it where you can combine all of them, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. I I mean, that's so smart. And when I first started learning about Amazon, that's something that I didn't really realize. Like there's a strategy to getting these items for lower. So you can participate in selling them. Whereas like, you know, you might walk into Walmart and see like, well, this is priced at, you know, 1997 and it's selling for 20. How are these people getting it for so little to be able to profit? And this, this is how. Yeah. Oh, I would figure that all the like, I would search stuff all the time. And it was stuff I knew wasn't like wholesale items. Uh, and I'd be like, how are people finding this where they're making any money? Like these people are stupid. They're, they're, I, they're losing it for $4. I'm like, I know how to run Google. I can search 20 different sites. I'm like, how are these people finding it? But and then the next week, I'd be like, oh, the site's running a sale. I'm like, oh, and I can get a 10% off gift card. Oh, and it's 4% racket. And you know what? Okay, now I can make money. <laughs> Yep, now it makes sense. So yep. you've mentioned a couple different uh, tools that you use, like uh, Keepa. I know you use Keepa, um, Brickseek. What are some of the other tools that you use all the time? Yeah, I mean, so obviously you guys know my passion for Keepa. Uh, so Keepa is my number one thing. If if you are selling on Amazon, you have to use Keepa. It's you should factor that into your budget. It should be forty dollars for the Amazon account. It's beyond worth it. Keepa, Keepa, keep. You shouldn't buy anything for Amazon without looking at a Keepa chart. So I use that obviously. So uh, I started using Seller Amp. Uh, I enjoy Seller Amp. Um, it just kind of gives you a breakdown of everything for the product. You can see like your normal profits. Uh, it gives you like a little mini Keepa chart. Uh, I just more use that as like a quick searching tool just to see if like Amazon's on it or something. But it shows you like all the variations. It shows you stock counts for everyone so it's, it's like a like a all it's a good all-in-one tool and then i also use inventory lab inventory lab makes putting my shipments together uh very easy it organizes things it's good if i'm trying to uh figure out like sales for you know a particular uh asin um i use it if, especially if i'm working with a new wholesale place or something like that i'll check my prop like my percentage on profits from that place to decide if i want to continue to use them and that kind of stuff as well too so probably keep a seller amp and inventory lab to me are the ones that I 
I will say I couldn't run my business without. Um, but again, I do have tactical arbitrage and I use that. Do you use any um, scanning apps at all? What, as far as like... Like for RA to go in and FBA scan is one that we used to use. There's Scoutly. Oh, uh, no, I honestly, I like, so, uh, seller amp has an actual, like, like one you can use a mobile one. So, I mean, I'm, I'm honestly just using the seller central app just to get the basic information, seeing if it hits the normal mate, like the, the normal thing is okay. Does it make me at least, uh, so I use $3 as, as my minimum for a product to make me, um, just cause I'm thinking like taking into account prep time, stuff like that. It was a little bit less when I was doing it myself. Cause obviously I wasn't paying somebody else, but like now that I'm paying somebody, I want to make sure that it's, you know, I know I'm paying them. So it's gotta be $3 profit in each category. It's gotta be under a certain rank. And then when I, and then I'll take that, if it hits those, then I'll take the ACE and bring it over to seller amp and then do a little bit more research. Cause on the mobile, you can get the keep a chart pretty easy um on seller amp where like online it's a lot smaller but yeah so if i'm if i'm in store i'm doing seller central to start with and then i'll bring it over to seller amp and then as long as it goes there i'm, I'm kind of diving into the keeper chart just to make sure but i don't use like i don't use scoutly i don't use what's uh scoutify uh i don't use any of that for that i mean it's all pretty much the same thing uh i just take the extra i just where those things a lot of the times can just all one part i just kind of go through my checklist I guess I'm old school in that sense that I like to just go through my checklist when I'm, I'm sure there's easier ways. So if someone were to get started on Amazon, if they're like brand new, do you think that they could get started just with a Keepa subscription? A lot of people will give you advice because there's obviously the, in, what the individual account and the professional account on, on Amazon. I don't know if it's called individual, but I think it's something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people will be like, Oh, use the individual until you're selling over 40. I don't, I, if you're going to dive in Amazon, uh, and the difference is $40 a month or not, you should maybe rethink this. Uh, it's my personal advice. I'm very blunt as far as this stuff goes. Uh, if you're going to dive in, dive in. I'm not saying you can't do this part-time. You can 100% do this part-time. I know a couple people that do this just like with extra income. They find a couple good items and they're making two, 300 bucks a month and they're super happy with that. And they still use professional, but you're going to win the buy box more and that kind of stuff. Uh, my suggestion is 100%, obviously the professional account at $40 a month and Keepa. Those are... the you need those. Like you can't do not, do not make any purchase without looking at a keeper chart. I don't, I don't care what the sales rank is. You might even find something that's literally number two in toys and it might look great, but maybe you found it that day and maybe Amazon's been on it for the last 924 days. And you don't realize that without looking at the keeper chart. So, you know, and you just happen to find the one day that they're temporarily out of stock. You might go heavy and buy a hundred of these and Amazon comes back on the next day and you're like, Oh Jesus. <laughs> That actually yeah. happened to me. I bought some old Bay Spice and I was new to, you know, looking at things and looking at the charts and with private label, that's how we started. So that's a whole different ball game. You're creating your own brand. So you don't have any stats, you don't have any data. So I bought these old Bay seasonings and I still have them to this day because I had to get them removed because they were so heavy. They were like a pound. And I looked and I was like, oh, it's because Amazon's on it. And I mm -hmm. happened to look at it and they were not on it and it looked so good and I shipped some in and they sold right away and then I bought more and I'm stuck with the ones I bought because by then Amazon went on the listing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and I'll still to this day, I mean, there's certain things where if Amazon's on and off, on and off, I might buy a smaller amount, but I mean, if Amazon's been on there for the last year and a half and they, and they just went out of stock, I, they might just be restocking. They might do this. So like, it's, it's tough, but you want to have that knowledge where, like you said, you, you saw it, you even sent some in and sold some where I've had the mistake where I, I didn't check, bought stuff. By the time I sent it in, Amazon was already back. So I didn't even sell any of them. Um, and then it sits there and then you're like, well, I don't want storage fees. So I'll call it back. Um, so yeah, it's, it's Keepa. Long, 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 long story short, Keepa. <laughs> Profession, professional account keep up you need those non-negotiable if you're going to sell on amazon those yeah matt actually has a really in-depth uh keep a course that he put together a while back um i've taken it and it is just every single thing he goes line by line explaining every single thing about keep a um and if we can we'll link to that below um whether that's on youtube if you're watching or in the podcast uh notes so you guys can check that out if you want to learn more because it is kind of in depth and it's really important to be able to read those keep charts accurately to know if you're making a great purchase decision or not and then like i use like actual examples of products that i've actually sourced and bought in the past in this so like it's not like i'm just feeding you a whole bunch of information like i use like hey this is a product i bought 
And this is what I looked at in order to decide if I was going to buy it. Talk to us a little about like if someone was starting brand new on Amazon, what advice would you give them if they want to build it to like the point that you're at now? Like what can they do to start doing that? Um, I mean, honestly, it's videos, 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 whether it's YouTube. Um, if you actually search the right keywords on TikTok, you can actually find people showing like what they're doing and that kind of stuff too. Um, and then it's, it's going on Instagram. It's, it's networking, talking to people, not being afraid to ask questions. I think it's the biggest thing. Some people are like afraid to ask questions. The worst case, you ask them any questions, they don't answer. It's the same thing as if you didn't ask them, you know what I mean? So it's just, you know, and, and I've reached out to big names in, you know, the reselling community. Some of them are responded. Other people, you just, you don't get an answer, which is, which is fine. It's not anything, it's not anything against them. You know, they're obviously very busy people as far as that goes, but you, you're not going to know these answers unless you reach out. And I mean, a lot of the times you can consume people, people's content, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Instagram, and you'll figure out which people are just kind of like giving you that guru feel of they're just like, oh, they're just trying to feed me information. And then two seconds later, they're going to, you know, try and sell me their thousand dollar course, you know, or people that are genuinely here to help. Like the people that are here to help, they're giving you more detailed information where I feel like a lot of the times, like the gurus give you like the basics because they want you to be like, oh, well, I want to know more. And then obviously that's what like dives you in. So I think a lot of people that provide a more detailed explanation, even if it's just like random things, uh, like when I was explaining how to do Cole's cash, like that kind of stuff, like you, if you can find somebody that's going to give you more detailed, specific information, usually those are the people I enjoy following. Um, usually the people, those are the people you can reach out to and they'll actually give you an answer. Um, sometimes it takes them a week to get back to you. I'm very guilty of that, <laughs> but they enjoy giving those answers. Like I have plenty of nights where I literally will just sit down and instead of watching TV, I go on my Instagram and I answer the 60 questions that I've gotten from the week that I just haven't had time to. It's not that I don't enjoy to, it's just, I mean, sometimes when I'm doing, it, I literally have to sit down and just like, okay, this is, this is my Instagram answering time. Um, and that kind of stuff, but you have to watch videos. And again, don't limit yourself to one person. If you find somebody you enjoy, absolutely. And if you notice that their information is good, continue to watch them, but don't limit yourself to one person. But again, ask questions. You're going to make mistakes. I cannot stress that enough. You're going to make mistakes, make them learn what not to do. Um, but reach out, talk to people, uh, and then go to events. That's another thing. I think a lot of people don't talk about is go to events, meet people, your relationships with them is is very different. I mean, actually, I know I haven't met you in person, but I've met Liz in person. It's 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 different conversations that I have with Liz now than than it was before. Um, because you've met these people. I mean, I've probably in the reselling community. I mean, I obviously go to ASD, the trade show in Vegas, and I mean, between that, and going to other things, I've probably met. 50 resellers that I still talk to currently like in person, go to these, go to these networking events. There are local stuff all the time. I mean, I'm probably 45 minutes from Boston, but I see like Boston reselling events all the time. And I try and go to as many as I can. Yeah. I think that's really important. And you're right. A lot of people don't talk about that. I think, especially from the pandemic, we're so used to like now kind of keeping a safe distance between each other. Um, but like getting to know the people in your community and building that community around you, like, that's really going to help if you come across, if you're stumbling, if you're faltering, if you need some assistance, like those are the people that are going to help you uh, like basically get your shit back together. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And I've had so many people that uh, because I talked with somebody else and like did a small interview or helped answer them a question. So many people are like, Oh, I, I talked to this person. They told me to come talk to you. I talked to this person. They told me to come talk to you and you, you, you won't do that. Even if you're new. And again, like, you might ask somebody something and they'd be like, Oh, I don't know this, but they all like go talk to this person. Like this is their, that's their specialty. They're good at this. They'll give you the right answers. Yeah, absolutely. So switching gears just a little bit. Um, tell us the difference now. I, we haven't mentioned it on this episode, but we've talked about it in other episodes, the difference between buying something that you're going to send out to Amazon right now and something that you're going to hold on to for the future. How do you know the difference between those items and what do you look for? Uh, keep a chart. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it depends. So I know a lot of people, so there are some people that like, that's their business models. They buy stuff to hang on to. Um, I actually don't tend to do a ton of that. I'll do like a lot of after holiday sales and stuff like that, where, you know, you, but I'll wait till it's 75% off, 90% off. Obviously, a lot of the times it's slim pickings, but occasionally you can get a store that just, you know, didn't mark it down. Like they still got the 50% off signs up, but it's actually 90% off because they're just their seasonal department's terrible. Love those stores. I have I have a list of those stores that I know, like hey, this department manager is not 
on top of their game. So like I, I go to those stores first. And again, that comes with time. I don't suggest that for somebody that's new, um, just because having access to as much of your budget as you can uh, in, in the moment is very much important. And you got to think about it this way. I might be able to get something for 90% off and I might get 300% margins when I wait and sell it the next year. But at the same time, how many times could I have taken that same dollar amount and turned it over throughout the year um, while waiting to do that? So I do do that with certain things. I have certain things that I buy every year. But for the most part, it's so much better to just focus on like the now. Anything that's seasonal, you're going to see uh, on the keeper charts, you're going to see the amount of sellers uh, during a certain season go crazy up and then crazy down. So like whether it's Christmas items or whether it's like uh, like pool floaties and like that kind of stuff or we like pools in general. Um, now you got to remember something like pools, um, just because I live up north and obviously it gets cold and pools is a very limited amount of time pools and stuff down south is all year round for the same reason that I actually uh, love during the winter time one to get out of New England I'll take a trip down towards like Florida pretty much every year and I'll do like a big uh, RA sourcing trip uh, you'll find like winter hats and winter beanies are in abundance down in Florida um, because the only people down in Florida buying them are buying them for style not for actual need um, so a lot of the times during like December and January I go down there, they've got them marked down. We don't have any of them up here. So I'm buying them and then reselling them that way because of that. So like thinking about seasonal items, you have to think about it twofold. Christmas is usually, and again, random Christmas stuff will sell throughout the year. But for the most part, Christmas is just Christmas where sometimes like a summer seasonal thing is more popular in the summer, um, but it still sells year round. So literally just looking at the keeper chart, looking at usually a lot of the times the amount of sellers where Christmas items, you're going to see the amount of sellers skyrocket pretty much now until January. And then you're going to see it dip down and then it's going to stay, stay dipped down. So you're going to look for that on the keeper chart to see when the amount of sellers even the summer items. So like where Christmas, it's going to do one of these summer is just going to do one of these and then just kind of like slowly die down and then kind of like have a baseline for it where Christmas is just up and gone. <laughs> um, so honestly, the, the amount of sellers is a good way to judge uh, how much something is like seasonal in and out, that kind of stuff. If you think it's a seasonal item, I mean, you'll have random items like I'll, I'll have random toys, not even fourth quarter. You'll see up and down. That just might be something where it was like clear and set like a whole bunch of Walmart's targets, like that kind of stuff too. But that's a good indicator. If you see, if you're tempted to buy something and if you see the amount of sellers went from like 20 to 60, uh, maybe think about not buying that because that price is usually, if, if the amount of sellers is going this way, that price is going this way. Yeah. So touching really quick on the seasonal items, I know one of the big fears that people have about selling on Amazon is the returns. And I know that uh, seasonal items tend to have a higher rate of return than like a non-seasonal item. So obviously that's just a part of business. It's just a part of selling on Amazon, but how do you process your returns and what do you do with them? Sure. Yeah. I mean, returns in general, it's the cost of doing business. You have to expect returns. There's there's no business model, unless you're doing all grocery, uh, there's no business model where you're not going to get returns. Um, and then even with grocery, if it's like expiration days, that kind of stuff, you can get returns. But but so a lot of the times what I do, uh, so most of my returns in general, whether it's seasonal or otherwise, um, I obviously open everything, inspect it. And then if it looks like it's gently used or that kind of stuff, a lot of times that's when I throw it up on eBay. Um, just because obviously like, I think people see Amazon as a platform of just like new items. Uh, like, I don't think I've ever gone on Amazon and searching for a used item. I just, I don't think about it. But like, if I want, like, I know if I want like a gently used item, I go right to eBay. Like, I don't even think about it. Like, I know I didn't, it was three quarters of the way into uh, baseball season. And I was like, I don't really want to buy a brand new glove. I just want something that's going to last me. I went right to eBay. I didn't, I didn't look, I didn't think to look on Amazon. I didn't even, nope. I just went right to eBay. I didn't Google it. I just went right to eBay. So a lot of times, like if I'm selling like a, a Nike slide and that kind of stuff and, you know, somebody tried it on, but they ripped the tag off. Now I don't have the, I don't have the tag. I don't have the box. I don't have the cardboard hanger. I've got just the, the, the slides, you know, I'll then list those over on, on eBay. And a lot of times I can like break even, I can still sell it for a decent amount and just like break even. So, so. your thought process there is to, you want to get your your money back so you can reinvest it into something else right yeah i mean uh, so it's tough i think it, at this scale when i when i was a lot newer if uh something came back and it was still within like that store's return policy i would actually just return it back to the store um which you are more than allowed to do because i mean you are technically the original customer that purchased it. Um, but now it's a lot, it's like, it's not any kind of like arrogance, but like, it's not worth it for me to take one item back to a Kohl's. Like it's, it's, it's not because the amount of, the amount of money that I, 
could have made during the time just to go to Kohl's, stand in line, do the return, stuff like that. Um, it's not worth it at this point for me. When you first start, absolutely. Because the, the money that you have, especially when you don't have like other, if it's, if it's just you, the money that you have is everything. That's how you're going to build your business. Um, for me now, minus time, I'm, I'm paying somebody else to polybag things for me because it's, it's, I can make more money by doing something else. If it's a return, if I can do it online, great. I'll process the return. I'll box it up. I'll do that myself. But if I physically have to go to the store, I'm probably listing it on eBay. Uh, and I'm either trying to break even or just like lose, end up losing a dollar or two on it um, because it's, I, I can make that up by searching for something else than I would have by going to the store. Yeah. I think that's a really underrated point actually that a lot of resellers don't understand is how valuable their time is. Um, even at the beginning, if you, if it's like something that you think you can sell on eBay and just break even and get your money back, do that instead of driving, whatever it is, 10, 20 minutes to the store, standing in line and customer service, arguing with the customer service lady over whether you can return it or not. And then yep. driving your 10, 15 minutes back home. Your genius is not in going to the store to return items. Your genius is in running your business and that's where you're going to make more money. Um, I really wish that we could like post that on billboards, like all over the country, actually, like where people <laughs> need to realize like how valuable their time is and not undersell themselves, honestly. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, I think about it, if I was going to go to Kohl's or turn something, I mean, we'll say all in all, probably about an hour, just like if I was to go do the whole process and I think about how many different products, whether not even refillables, like if I was going to go search for a brand new product, I could on a bad day, find two good new products in an hour. And that might be something that could make me thousands of dollars over the course of a year. But instead I went to Kohl's and you know, I, I got my 1495 back. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. Now again, when if it's if it's just you, you're not if you're not paying anybody else, and you know if your budget is like five hundred dollars for the month, yeah, go back to the store, go get that. It's worth it. You have to figure out at a certain point you transition to you know you need to figure out okay my time is worth this much per hour when I first start six months in. Okay, now my time is worth this much per hour. Four years in, obviously, my time is is very much, you know, I value it different per hour. So you need to look at that. Okay, is this action that I'm going to do, is that going to make me enough for that hour in order to justify it? Or could I make more doing something else? Yep, 100%. I absolutely agree with that. So what have you done specifically over the last couple of years to grow your business to the point you're at now? Give us some like really specific things. Sure. Uh, I mean, honestly, uh, the biggest thing is hiring people. Um, because again, uh, once you get to a point where, I mean, obviously one, you have to be able to afford it. Um, so you had to have had to put in the work beforehand. It's, it's, the long days, the late nights, but again, it's very different. So like before, you know, I was working 70, 80, 90 hours sometimes at the grocery store, but I was there, I was pinned there, couldn't do anything else. We're here. I can still work 90 hours and it doesn't feel like 90 hours because you know what? I'm hungry. I'm going to stop and eat. Cool. I can go home. I can go home, relax a little bit, jump in the hot tub, come back, go to work. It, like it's, it's, a, it's a different 90 hours as far as that goes, but you have to be able to, you know, be willing to put in the work. Biggest thing is being able to grow is one, you need to, I think a lot of people focus now. And again, when you first start focusing on like, um, getting better margins is great because you want to get that return because you obviously don't have the bigger investment. I think a lot of the times in order to grow to a certain extent, you need to make sure you're willing to, Obviously, you still want good margins, but you want to be able to focus on quantity as well, too. Once you can get to that point where you're selling 40 of this, 100 of this, because those are the stuff you're going to get and you're going to get those refillables. Uh, refillables is a huge thing as far as being able to grow. Um, you want to be able to get to a point where, so like now, I've got warehouse employees, uh, obviously, like internet, electric, got all the overhead. So my goal right now is in order to get my refillables that takes care of all my bills for the month. And everything on top of that is going to be um, just additional profit where the company is growing and stuff like that. Focus on those refillables, take the extra time in order to find those things. You're not going to, you're not going to find refillables at a Marshall's or TJ Maxx. Now don't get me wrong. There's been plenty of things like uh, Tickle Me Elmo's. I have sold over 1600 of those. Um, just from, uh, from TJ Maxx and Marshall's that's as close to a refillable as you can get, but now they don't carry it anymore. So you never know when they're going to stop carrying it. Uh, I've got some, my top sellers are comical, uh, <laughs> and, and, and my, my overall time. So you can't think of those as refillable items. Those are great. Those are good additional things. Um, but you have to get to the point where you have the refillables getting to the point where you're hiring someone again, it's just your time is, is worth a lot being able to find new things. So now instead of like, if I order, 
a hundred hats. Uh, I'm not spending the time to poly bag the hundred hats myself. I order the hundred hats. They come in. She can at this point probably do all hundred in an hour, but like you pay them a certain amount. And if you think about it, cool. I, I would easily pay that where now I search for another hour for more products. So you have to get to the point where you can hire people, get certain process. Like we have all these tables. When the stuff comes in, it goes here. When we're prepping stuff, it, it goes here. When it's ready to go and be boxed up for Amazon, it goes here. So develop those processes. And then that's going to help you grow as far as that goes. And again, having understanding keeper charts and knowing when to up buy on something, it's very daunting. I still catch myself and I know better. I catch myself all the time being like, oh, you know, like I should buy 400 of these. Eh, I'm only going to buy 200. And then as soon as you sell it 200, you're like, oh, I should have bought 400. So having the confidence uh, to be able to buy is a huge thing as far as growth. Like I think that's very, very underrated as far as having the confidence. But again, it's not... It's not having the arrogance to buy 400 or something. It's having the confidence to buy 400 because you've looked at the keep chart. You've seen the sales history. You understand the graphs and you know that based on everything I have in front of me, this should sell. Yeah. Amazon is, I think, a lot more data driven than other platforms because they provide so much more. There's so much more data available to us basically on Amazon. And um that I think that's something that people get stuck on, especially if they're coming from a different platform like eBay or Poshmark, maybe. Poshmark doesn't have a lot of data. eBay has more data than Poshmark, but certainly not as much as Amazon. So you really need to do your research and make sure that you're making educated buying decisions because you don't want to get burned and then end up with boxes of you know stuff that you can't you can't sell on there. Yeah. There's, there's so much data on Amazon. Like for example, there's zero data on Walmart. Like there's no sold comps. There's no nothing. <laughs> yeah. So my research for Walmart is, does it sell well on Amazon? Okay. It probably sells well over on Walmart. So yeah, it, 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 there's so much information on Amazon. Again, if you're buying stuff without Kiba, uh, you're, you're genuinely, you're not going to be successful long-term. I, I promise you, you're not going to be, but like, there's so much data available on Amazon for you to make educated, like purchasing um, that it would be, there are certain things you're not going to know. You're not going to know that Amazon is going to jump back on. You're not going to know that this random seller is going to randomly pop in with 500 units and they were able to market it $4 less than you. You're not going to know that. But it's very tough to not be successful if you put in the time and understand um, keep a charts and everything. If you understand that stuff on Amazon, it's hard to not be successful. If you're not successful, uh, you're just lazy. Love I'll it. be blunt. <laughs> it's the absolute truth though. You're hundred yep. percent correct. Yep. What do you think is the biggest mistake that you've made on Amazon? I think honestly, the biggest mistake is I didn't understand variations. So like, for example, I can use this example because they're a whole bunch of them sitting in my warehouse. Um, so with variations, obviously, so there's the parent ASIN, which is like encompasses the whole thing. So my, I'll use a real product. Um, so I had these uh, NBA basketball, like laundry hoops. So it's literally just like a hoop you can throw in the back of your door and it's just got like a four foot net. You can just throw your laundry in. Um, so not understanding variations. I obviously, I mean, I'm a sports guy. So like, I know what teams are popular. Um, but at the same time, I just saw that like, I saw that this listing as a whole, I was like, oh, it's, it's a great rank. So this product sells all the time, this and that. So I ended up buying this one wholesale site we had, had only these four teams available. So I bought, uh, they were case, I think I bought 48 of these four teams. So 48, 48, 48, 48. Uh, I didn't understand variations where the popular teams were one, selling for less and two, they're just more popular. Um, so I think I had these sitting in there for like six months and, uh, I had sold one of one, two of another, zero of another and zero of another. So I had sold three units out of almost 200 because I didn't understand variation. There's plenty of tools within Keepa that shows you, Hey, this variation is more popular. You have to like take into account like, okay, you know, this team might be popular, but if this is selling for $29.99 and all the rest are selling at $14.99, you're probably not going to sell a ton at that $29.99. So um, I think my biggest mistake is not understanding variations. Um, it's very easy when you just have, when you have a product and that's it. Like if this is the only thing on the listing, that chart is for that product. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that when they're looking at variations, whether it's different shoe colors, whether it's different sports teams, um, whether it's different sizes within shoe colors or shoe colors within different shoes um, or even like shirts, medium, small, large, extra large, like understanding which one of those sells the most. Uh, I've learned that mistake hard a bunch of times because I bought a whole bunch of stuff with variations many different times, but it's, it's easy. Again, now it's easy to understand 
that I know how to look at it. But I still have those laundry basketball hoops sitting in my warehouse. For yeah, they're still here. <laughs> Christmas gifts, man. I, <laughs> if they were local sports teams, yeah. But I'm not going to give like a Colorado team to somebody. Who, yeah, I don't know. True. Very true. Yeah. Well, yeah. maybe maybe they'll come back. Maybe they'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> sure. What do you think? So the opposite of that, what do you think your biggest success has been in your business so far? Like product or something I'm doing? Dealer's choice. Uh, Well, product would be easily tickle me Elmo. uh, And that has provided me with so many videos, uh, way too many laughs. For a while, like some of my local Marshalls and TJ Maxx, I would walk in and the store manager would be like, oh my gosh, it's the Elmo guy. And I'm like, that's, (laughs) I'm a six foot five big guy for me to walk in and customers that don't know who I am be like, this is a big giant. They're calling me Elmo guy. <laughs> it was fun. It was great. I made a ton of money off of that. Yeah. I think my big, biggest success was honestly just like getting out of working out of my house and into a warehouse. Um, as much as don't get me wrong, it's fun to work from home. It's great, but obviously you have uh, you know limitations as far as that goes. So I think that was my big, big, biggest success because I, I felt like a business then. It was, it was still a business. I was still doing you know very well working out of, out of my house. But I mean, like, I don't miss lugging boxes up and down out of my basement and, you know, Oh crap. The, the mail guys here, I've still got 40 boxes. I got to bring up and down, uh, you know, from, from merchant fulfilled orders and that kind of stuff. So I, I think my biggest success was, was moving into a warehouse and, you know, even like hiring my first person just because it like, it, then it, it felt like a business. I'm, I'm succeeding enough that I can do this. Yeah. Those are really good answers. I think, uh, especially when you hire your first person or outsource something, then you start to feel like really official, like, oh my gosh. And the more you treat your business like an actual business and work on it that way, um, it just compounds like that feeling just compounds over and over again. Yeah. And it's still, it's, it's always going to feel like a business, but I think the biggest thing that I've enjoyed is that I still, I make sure that I still feel the freedoms of this. Like there's plenty of days that, you know, like I'm not saying setting an alarm most days. Like that was my, that was my favorite thing when I first started doing this. It's just, I know I'm going to put in the hours. It doesn't matter if I wake up at 6am or if I wake up at 10am, I'm, I'm going to put in the hours. If I needed to sleep, I needed to sleep. Um, you know, you just work a little bit later that day. So like you still, as, as much as business, as much as I'm still, I mean, especially this time of year, it'll still be 80, 90 hours a week this time of year. Um, but like you still have the freedoms. That's, that's, that's the biggest thing to me. Absolutely. So you've talked about this a little bit online before. I'm not sure if the video is still up on your Instagram or not, but can you dig into Cole's cash for us? Sure. Like, give us some details. <laughs> um, so with Cole, I mean, and I use this kind of technique with a lot of different places. I mean, obviously, so like Cole's cash is different because you're earning a certain amount and then you're using it um, afterwards as well too. But like a lot of places, so like for another example, DSW, a lot of times like you, you earn rewards and that kind of stuff. And I'll, I'll wait to use those rewards for their sales. Now, Cole's cash is a little bit different in the sense that um, it's usually the same time periods when you're doing it. So you can usually earn on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, now, depending on the time of year, it's every week or every other week. So sometimes there's like two weeks in between. But so what the first time you're doing it, you're going to have to, you can't obviously can't use because you haven't built it up. Um, but say for easy example, I'll have, I'll earn, so you get $10 for every 50 you spend. So on a good weekend, I'll earn, you know, on a normal weekend, I'll earn $400 in Kohl's cash. Sometimes it's a twenty dollars at a whack, thirty dollars at a whack, whatever. It's it's all different amounts. So then, what I'll do in order to use it, so you can use it that following Monday. And a lot of people use it right away because they have it. They're like, I got to spend it. I'm gonna get some inventory, but you have to be patient with it. So the whole point is, is you're gonna wait until the next time you can also earn Kohl's cash while your Kohl's cash that you have is still good. So what you're doing is you're literally rinsing and reusing. So say, for example, um, I'm buying a $25 product. I'm going to buy 10 of them. So it's going to cost me $250. The first time I do it, I'm spending $250. Then I'm earning $40 in Kohl's cash. So then the next time, what I'm doing is I'm waiting for the next cycle where I can earn and I can use what I have. So I'm going to put the same order in. So say, for example, if it's just like a shoe, uh, I'm going to put the exact same order in and it's going to be $250. Now I'm going to use $40 in Kohl's cash, but because it's still over $200, I'm earning another 40 on top of that. So now all I'm doing is I'm literally just making my average buy costs. Now it's $21 instead of $25 because I use 40, but I also earn 40. So I, in essence, just to wash as far as Kohl's cash. And then either next week or two weeks from then, I have another $40 available. 
So I'm literally, again, the first time when you first do it, you're going to have to pay a full price um, and you're earning the, the Kohl's cash. But you just have to remember every week or two weeks, you want to check, okay, can I spend it and earn it at the same time? And then like I try and make sure those margins are the same where if I'm going to use 40, I want to make sure I'm earning 40. Or like if I'm buying something that's $500, you're going to you know, you're gonna be earning 80 so I can use 80 and so on and so forth, just depending on what it is. So, but yeah, yeah. That is the stuff that makes me so excited to do uh, retail and online arbitrage. I love the whole gift card thing and, you know, using your Kohl's cash strategically and, oh my gosh, the cashback sites. It's just, there's so much opportunity out there that I think um, like people sleep on a little bit, Um, but learning how to use that stuff to your advantage is so important because like Matt said earlier, that's the difference between being able to profit on, on, on an item or not being able to. So and it's and it's honestly the biggest thing with like Kohl's cash and that kind of stuff. It's a great way to get items that are regular, like regular priced, and sell those on Amazon. The more items you can find that are, I think everybody thinks you're just trying to find clearance items, clearance items, clearance items because those are cheap. Um, the more regular price items you can find, you're going to get a lot less competition, um, and you know, so you're going to be able to sell the product quicker. And again, if you can find them cheap. Not everybody understands these strategies and not everybody's going to be able to find this kind of stuff at that price. So you're going to sell it a lot better, but doing Kohl's cash stuff like Rakuten, like it's, it's a no brainer. I think my last big fat check from Rakuten, I think it was like $1,900. Oh my it's, gosh. <laughs> it's, 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 it's click a button. It's all you got to do guys. Yeah, yeah, it is easy. I always recommend people do that. I mean, why not? And I think especially with online arbitrage, the goal is to try to get the buy cost as cheap as you can. That's the only way that you're going to really have good profits. Yeah. And it, oh, and, it, and again, touching on this, because I know earlier I was talking about like, I'll go and I'll check and see if, if, if gift cards are discounted. I'll go into Rakuten every single day too. That's part of my list because there'll be random stores that are 10%, 15%, but just for that day. You either have to do it different ways. So I know a lot of people that just take the Rakuten check and that's their fun money. That's their next trip and that kind of stuff. Uh, and I will do that to a certain extent. But at the same time, if a store is 10% or 15% and I'm factoring that into my buy costs, I'll, I'll take advantage of that because there's there was one time where it was literally 15% on like three different stores. And I mean, I think I earned almost like $1,100 on a weekend once just on, on Rakuten. I mean, this is probably six months ago, but it was just, it was $1,100 on a weekend because it was 15% off. So like I was using, I remember there was, I don't even remember what the site was, but there was one site I was using 15% Rakuten. I had 12% gift cards and they were like, buy one, get one half off on like most of the things on the site. Like I was getting stuff for like 50 bucks and it ended up being like 21. And like, it was just, it was ridiculous. I, I want to say I ended up spending like $40,000 in one weekend. But you have to take advantage of those. You have to you have to set yourself up beforehand. I know that that seems like it's a ridiculous number, um, but you like you have to set yourself up beforehand. You have to be ready. You have to understand keep a charts so you can make those purchases, and you have to watch stuff every day. I know sometimes it might be annoying. Uh, if you're thinking about, I don't want to go check the same 20 sites every single day. Well, cool. If you don't want to make money, then don't go make money. And if it works for you to have those lists, have those lists. Okay, cool. I check this site. Now I got to check this site. Okay. Let me go. Let me go to my gift card sites. Okay. Is there anything that seems out of the norm? Okay. This site's normally 4%. Now it's 8%. You know what? I'm going to buy these gift cards today for 8%. Hang on to them. Rakuten. Oh, hey, you know, Adidas is normally 2%. Today is 15%. I'm going to go, let me go check out Adidas. You, you have to take advantage of those. Like that's honestly the biggest way to make a lot of money where again, you're, you're not buying the same stuff that everybody else is buying. That's so important. And being able to pay attention to that stuff and remember the information. And like you said, keep spreadsheets. Like that is the difference between a successful Amazon seller and one that's not successful. I, I think anyways. Yep. No, I agree. Definitely agree. Yeah. All right. So we have one last question for you, Matt. Sure. Ready? All right. If you could give our fellow resellers one piece of advice on how they can turn their paycheck into a day check, what would it be? Um, You have to be willing to grind. I know that is a very basic answer, but the people that are successful are the people that put in the work, the people that put in the long nights, that put in, you know, the early mornings and that kind of stuff. Anybody that's successful, unless they've won the lottery or been handed money, um, they've made sacrifices. Um, You know, my biggest thing that I tell people is is short-term sacrifice for long-term success. Um, 
that's the best piece of advice I can give somebody as far as that goes. Um, you're going to do well if you put in the work and if you understand things and if you ask questions. So uh, asking questions, networking, I know this isn't a one answer. This is a multi answer, but put in the grind. The grind just encompasses it all. Talking to people, putting in the work, doing the hours, making mistakes. Um, the, the, the grind is, is the way to go. That's amazing. Love the answer. We so appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to come and talk to us and give our listeners and watchers some really specific and detailed information about selling on Amazon. We so appreciate you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank Thank you for having me. I appreciate it, guys. All right, guys, that's a wrap on today's episode. Thank you so much for listening to the Paycheck to Paycheck Reselling Podcast. Anything we mentioned in this episode will be linked down below in the show notes or description down below. Be sure to share this episode with anyone you think it will help and follow us on social media at P2D Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Keep working towards that day check.